Today we're talking about after images. I'm gonna assume that most of you guys are already familiar with what after images are, but for those of you who are not, allow me to explain. The first entry in Webster's Dictionary describes an after image as being a usually visual sensation occurring after stimulation by its external cause has ceased. Those optical illusions you see online, take your, take your eyes off of it and now it's like, whoa, I see this like negative imprint of my camera that I was just staring at and that's an after image. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about culturally relevant after images. We're talking about the after images that you find in like anime and manga and video games. So what's normally being implied here with the word after image is that a subject moves so fast or with such impeccable rhythm that onlookers perceive a trailing multiple of images resembling the original subject. Many legendary video games have made stellar, seamless use of this after image technique over the years, and in doing so, have left a sizable impact on me and many others alike. Early retro video games did not often make use of after images due to the hardware demands, by the end of the fourth console generation, games had begun using the technique to impressive effect. Still, however, rendering capabilities like sprite transparency would be necessary to see after images take off in full. These necessary hardware demands were all but answered with the advent of the fifth generation consoles like the N64, Sega Saturn, and PS1. The catch being that these systems could all handle 3D rendering as well, which would introduce enough proprietary issues such that after image wouldn't really ever catch on as a common aesthetic for 3D games. And as technology further developed in the coming years, AAA games veered away heavily from the arcade aesthetic of after images in favor of leveraging that hardware to attempt realism. This is not to say that 3D after image effect is not desirable or achievable in our modern day, quite the opposite, but today I'm concerned with exploring technical approaches to displaying these after images in a 2D setting. In my opinion, the most striking example of after images in video games can be found in the 90s arcade cabinet Street Fighter games. To explore a technical solution to this retro concept of after images, I'm turning to Godot. Godot has been my engine of choice lately, though this sort of implementation should be similar in Unity, Unreal, or any other modern game engine. For this video, I don't have any game to use as a dummy for the implementation, so we'll create a quick test scenario. You might be tempted to duplicate your sprite node in order to achieve the after image effect. And while I'll be exploring shaders for this implementation, please feel free to do that if it suits your needs. Most of what I'm doing here is kind of visual fluff so that you can get the full experience later on once we have the after images. But something to discern here is that I'm using a character with multiple frames of animation in one texture. This is because if the character that I choose does not change its pose, it will not require a complex solution. To achieve the basic effect, we only need to create a GPU particles 2D node parented to our actor and add a particle process material. Set the process material gravity to zero and the texture to be the same as your image. This is the most basic after image effect we can achieve at a low cost. If we build on this approach and have the after images reflect the current frame of our sprite using the default particle process material, we start running into issues. At first glance, it can be achieved by restricting the minimum and maximum animation offset to be the actor sprite's current frame over their total frames minus one. But what this does is update every particle on the emitter to that same frame, defeating the purpose of an after image. With an after image, you can see the animation spread out in real time, like with an onion skin in an animation program. Not so. This begs a new question. What now? We're going to need to write our own shader that allows us to do all the stuff that this particle process material doesn't let us do. I'll have the script on GitHub in the video description so you guys can all check it out. We need to start with some uniforms. In GLSL, a uniform is a global shader variable. The variables that we define as uniforms in our shaders will allow the GPU to get Ken's current animation frame from the CPU so that the shader knows which frame to assign if an after image were to spawn. The uniform only holds this information for us. We now need to define how Ken's current frame is used by each individual particle according to the shader. Because the shader code is all run on the GPU and the GPU is optimized for very specific kinds of calculations, we cannot easily store variables locally between frames for each particle displayed by this shader. There is a very limited amount of memory associated with each particle that gets stored between frames, which is accessed in Godot as built-in functions. What we are interested in today is the built-in vector4 returning function named custom, particularly custom.z, which stores the animation offset used by the current particle. This custom data varies by the type of shader. Looking at the particle shader, z controls the animation offset, as I mentioned, 
X controls the rotation angle in radians, and Y controls the phase during lifetime from zero to one. As far as I can tell, W is an extra float value that we can use to our discretion. Our main concern now is to update custom.z to reflect Ken's animation during the frame the after image is created. To achieve this, we will have the shader update custom.z to match the uniform indicating Ken's current sprite only when the built-in restart boolean returns true, meaning that this is frame one for our newly spawned after image. We can use the same formula as before for converting the current frame to a value usable as an offset, which is the current frame over the total frames minus one. In my rushed implementation, the CPU provides this data to the GPU every frame, but this can be improved later. In the heart of our process function, we can iterate on any of the initial conditions that we set on restart. In our case, we will probably want to fade the after image out, have it flicker, tear, or perhaps do all three. This is where we would write the implementation to all of that. Really, the core of the solution here is only like one or two lines of code, and in fine tuning the shader, the end product will likely become something more complex than the original one or two lines of code. Currently, the shader supports different colors, a toggle for continuous fading and, and piecewise fading, and scalability. Most of the research and work that went into understanding particle shaders in Godot and in GLSL was done by my friend Benji, so big thanks to him. Please go view his content on the subject. Thank you all for tuning in today. I hope this video taught you something new about After Images. Please subscribe for more niche subjects. See you all later.